you fail at a, a higher degree if you don't try than if you try and you fail all together. You know, uh, I always say you have to go for the edges. You have to challenge yourself and your team to, to define what those edges are and, uh, and go there. And the worst that happens is, you know, I, I like to call it kind of walking on the curb. You know, people go, why does Ariana always walk on the curb when she goes down the sidewalk? Because you focus a lot more than if you're just on a, you know, four foot wide sidewalk. Episode 143. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. In today's episode, you'll discover the number one mistake architects make with their marketing collateral. The post-it note method for making sure you have a smashing website that potential clients will love, the wine bar strategy for effective networking, and why our guest walks on the curb, and the powerful lesson you can learn from this. Today's guest is business development manager at AB Design Studio in Santa Barbara, California, Ariana Leopard. And with that, here's our show. So Ariana, so we just released the the episode with Clay. Um just this week, first one went out, and then of course the the ne next segment's going to go out next week. So I'm just curious, what what prompted you to actually personally want to be on the show as well? I've been listening to the show for eight months, nine months at least, and wow. found it an effective tool for you know marketing and architecture and marketing and kind of the design community as a whole is a new field. You know, I think firms recognize they need marketing, but they don't know what it looks like. So it's met with a great deal of resistance and change. Mm. And so I think something like this is easy as a tool to show, you know, principals, uh, you know, other team leaders, your tribe. And then they can, you know, listen to a couple episodes and go, oh, I get it. So while it's, you know, from a marketer to another marketer, it's also uh, something I can show like collateral in many ways to say, okay, this is what marketing is because it's sort of the undefined beast. You know, in an architectural firm, we call out every nail head, right? And a drawing, everything has to be perfect for our submittals. But marketing isn't like that. And it's very hard to approach people not thinking in that way, not wearing that hat of what it is that I do. So I think your podcast offers an interesting platform to convey different aspects of this field to other people. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. So I noticed your title, Ariana, at AB Design Studio is Business Development Manager. I know a lot of other marketing professionals actually go by the term of Director of Marketing or VP of Marketing or Marketing Director. Uh, is, is there some intentional word choice there? I don't think so. Um, this role, I met Clay and Josh, the, found, or the founding principals of AB. And I, this role was sort of created for me. They never had this position at the firm previously. So this was a four month sort of conversation and dialogue about what it is that AB Design Studio would like to see, what voids are there, you know, what do they wanna take off of their plates and sort of outsource to someone with a marketing background. So intentional, I'm not sure. It was just, it's a new position and we may change the role at some point, but when you have no infrastructure for it previously, what, what do you call it? Well, yeah, good point. So, and you, I went, I went as a brand ninja before. Uh, you know, I've heard everything from uh, what is it? Uh, oh, I mean everything. You know, chief cabinet member of marketing. I mean, I I come from the Bay Area, so all these startups are like, what do we call our marketing people? <laughs> so, you know, we can't just call them a marketing person. <laughs> yeah. We have some special name. Yeah. All right. So, well, 
I think it, it it would be interesting to talk about some of the some of the challenges and how you're settling into your role here because there may be architects listening to this episode who are thinking, you know, do I need a business development manager? Should I bring in an outside marketing person? So, you know, right off the bat, what are some of the tasks that you took off of Clay and Josh's plates? You know, we're very much in the business of people. And it is a full-time job to network, to go out, meet prospective clients, manage current clients, handle the press. And so those have been sort of my primary functions in addition to kind of making an assessment of where our collateral stands, you know, being more specific about who exactly are our target markets and how do we detail something to that. You know, I think a lot of people that aren't in marketing, what they do is they create sort of this one size fits all, the, the moo-moo of collateral. And then they try to put that on, you know, a $50 million hotel, a $10 million luxury residential estate, a boutique hotel, a restaurant. And it doesn't work that way. You really have to finely tune who it is you're marketing to and what it is that they're looking for. And I think when you're a principal architect, that, it, I mean, it's a full-time job, right? So they need to be in the studio more and they need to be concerned about press less or facilitating that interaction less and kind of do what they do best. And I think that is, and also, you know, watching changes in the market and the drifts that happen. And I think someone who can have their thumb on that all the time is quite valuable. Because I, you know, I like to say that architecture is not selling our services, it's selling a solution. So you have to see, you have to go out there and identify what problems people are having and then create the solution. We're sort of uh, beyond the era of traditional advertising where you create this product, put a bow on it, pay for a bunch of advertising, and then put it on TV or in print magazines. That's not how we work anymore. Absolutely. So you, it sounds like one of the things was getting some of their collateral in order and developing some new pieces of collateral that are more niche specific and speak to specific target segments. And producing content, I think, is sort of the tipping point for people. It's not just saying, you know, I design, the, you know, the Lark or the Funk Zone. Some of those are our big projects here. It's really defining your marginal utility in many ways and selling that and having the buildings we do, the, I'm sitting at one of our coffee shops right now that we design. And for me, it's what is, what is it that an architect really does? How, cause they go into people's homes, right? They look at what's, what are the breakdowns? What are the fracture points? They go into a restaurant, where is the flow uh, chaotic? And then they have to resolve that in some way and have a conversation with the owner. And I think, that's the part that people miss. You know, it's not just the drawings themselves. It's what the drawings represent. And I think that's the small gray area that architects don't sell very well. You use the words marginal utility. What does that mean, Ariana? You know, basically anything that you read in a, in a book, for the most part, is no longer highly competitive. It's, it's now common. So marginal utility is what do I provide that's not necessarily mainstream? You know, all the creativity books in the world aren't going to help you if you're unwilling to have a, you know, a shoddy, lame, and dangerously bad idea. So the thing about people I've learned is we're consistently uh, inconsistent. So, you know, how do you, how do you change with people? And part of it is how do we change our designs? How do we figure out what we, what we should be designing? You know, I'm not waiting for a client to, or a prospective client to come to my door. I'm finding them first. I'm finding someone randomly at a wine bar and saying, hey, there's this great piece of land. You should build something here. Here's how we go through the entitlement process. You know, once, once they come into your door, I think you're already 60% of the way there. So for us, the marginal utility is how do we help people that don't even know they have a problem yet? So you said that you spend, I mean, you could, it's a full-time job getting out there, networking, creating those relationships, meeting people face-to-face. -face. And where, where are you finding, where do you go to find clients? How much networking are you doing, Ariana? 
You know, it's, it's hard to define that because it's very much my personality. Uh, I'm in the wine business as well. And so I learned a lot from making wine, selling wine. Uh, you know, there's a million kinds of wine. There's a 170 Pinot producers in Santa Barbara County. You know, what makes mine consistently on the top of the list? And so part of how I go out there, I use the same approach for design and wine is you have to go to where your consumer market is, your prospective market. So um, I'm, for example, I'm building our, our new website right now and I have the beta up and I pass my laptop around with blank post-its on the screen to around a table with people I don't know, about 40 people and had them go through our website and then write comments on the post-it. And then eventually I got my computer back because to Thank me, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but to me, you know, I'm not selling my product to another architect. Uh, that's not my market. And I wanted consumers to go through the site and clients, prospective clients and how user friendly is it? Did the layout make sense? You know, do the photos, are they appealing? You know, what doesn't work for you and what does? And I got great feedback and you know, uh, whether I don't like to call myself a millennial, but you know, I do come from the Bay Area, and I think the nature of what we do in marketing is really guerrilla marketing. It's that unconventional task. I'm not going to ask a bunch of other architects what they think of my website because they're not the ones using it and calling me. They already know what I do. You know, every single architect in this town knows the projects we do without even going on our website. So it's little tactics like that. I think how you find people. Um, I go to wine bars with drawings and it's amazing. Everybody has a curiosity about design. There's not a single time I've gone out and someone hasn't come over and said, you know, what's that? What are you working on? And then we have these very interesting conversations about the synergy. I mean, I've met people from Citrix, you know, who are designing software and we talk about what it means to architect software versus a building. You know, there's a lot of synergy between winemaking and architecture. You know, I always like to say grapes are a lot like metal. You know, the more you twist it, bend it, manipulate it, it becomes structurally weaker. So there's overlaps in every single industry. Part of how you network and you connect is finding that overlap. You know, I could, uh, I could speak to you fluently in Italian, but if you don't speak Italian, speaking louder to you in Italian isn't going to help. You have to find that mutually understandable language. And I think that's what a someone in marketing does. They find someone who might not know the discourse and language of architecture and you bring them into that conversation. Were there any surprises in the, the website feedback process that you, that you got? Anything that came up that was unexpected? Um, not with how we designed it. I worked with a great web developer, uh, developer uh, Octavian, and he's very intuitive sort of of you know, what people are asking for, because he's doing this every day. But I found there was a lot of contrasting feedback between architects and what consumers were actually saying. You know, architects like this layout, you know, this high design, very artistic, you know, less user friendly. And consumers, you know, they want to see little pictures of everything, right? They want to pick and choose in the portfolio. They don't want to be forced to swipe through 90 photos. And I mean, if you're, if you're on gap.com or banana Republic, you know, you want to see all of the different pants laid out, right? You don't want to have to go through each pair to get to whatever's number 15 is. So I think that's where people, there's a disconnect. And for us, it's how do you bridge the gap between how an architect thinks and how the client thinks. And so for me, that's the best thing is feedback. Uh, my mentor, is sort of uh, a marketing executive at RTKL, which is a huge architectural firm. And we text every day, you know. Uh, we, are, we have this sort of running joke about, you know, people say, how did you get him to take you on as sort of a, a mentor in the industry when so many people probably asked that of him. And I said, well, I stalked him. And then eventually he kept me. <laughs> so, and now it's one of my greatest relationships in the design community. But he's, you know, he said one thing you have to do is you, every year, or sometimes more often, you have to ask people who came to you for a proposal and went with someone else, why? You have to check in with current clients of what in our process works and doesn't work. 
And then you kind of throw yourself out in the community. What's your perception of us? And it's hard to get that kind of feedback. But that is part of it. You ask where I find people. I go around town. We're Santa Barbara's smaller. And, you know, we, we kind of dominate the market in many ways here. But, you know, what is your perception of us? You know, a lot of people don't know we do residential. And so part of my role with AB was, you know, what do people really think that we do? Because we're acutely aware of what we do. But, you know, how now we have to change our representation in many ways. So it's like, okay, if people didn't know we do residential, then fine. We need to market differently in this way. So to me, I ask, you know, it, there's you fail at a, a higher degree if you don't try than if you try and you fail altogether. You know, uh, I always say you have to go for the edges. You have to challenge yourself and your team to, to define what those edges are and, uh, and go there. And the worst that happens is, you know, I, I like to call it kind of walking on the curb. You know, people go, why does Ariana always walk on the curb when she goes down the sidewalk? Because you focus a lot more than if you're just on a, you know, four foot wide sidewalk. So for us, do you really walk on the curb? I do. <laughs> I absolutely, I am kind of out there and how I strategize things, but I have to be kind of intimately aware of what people are doing. And I'm curious by people. And I think that is one thing someone in marketing has to be is have a genuine interest in people and the story that they want to tell and that they need to tell. Yep. And that's how I approach it. You know, I was a broker before this, a commercial broker in, in the San Francisco Bay area, which is sort of like being, you know, the infant shark in, in a pond of great white sharks. So how do you survive? And it's not just treading water. That's not, you know, hope is not a strategy is what I learned at a very young age. So what did you learn? What was the strategy? Action is always best. You know, and I know that's easier said than done, but waiting for everything to be perfect and then launching is not going to work anymore. I, I went on a, uh, I met a client actually at a smoothie shop and he wasn't a client at the time. And we started talking about design and he said, do you want to go for a hike? I said, yes. Um, you know, this is, and we went on a great five hour hike and we talked about software engineering and, um, and how he approaches things. And, he, and I asked him, you know, how has software changed in 10 years? And he said, you know, they used to wait for everything to be perfect and then they would launch it. And now what they're doing is they're launching software almost in infancy and changing it over time. If you think about your iOS updates, they don't wait for it 100%. You know, you get these little annoying updates on a weekly or bi-monthly basis, but that's the nature of change now. And I think that's the hardest thing for the design community is we're so used to, we have to have it perfect to submit, right? But marketing your services and then selling your, and presenting the product are sort of two different things, two sides of the same coin. So how are they? Well, one thing I want to get into, okay, Ariana, so let's discuss this. Uh, marketing and business development, how are they different or are they? You know, I think business development is really facilitating relationships and I think marketing is selling the quality of that relationship. Because I don't like to say services or products. That's not really what people are, are getting. That's sort of what you get after we have a conversation, right? No one's just going to say, yes, I'm hiring you. I don't, we've never spoken. I haven't seen your portfolio. You really have to start from the beginning. And so all of our articles that we've been producing, all the content we put out there now, all of the press interviews, we've had five press interviews in the last three weeks, have really been about discussing our project, but kind of as a lens of the broader discourse of what is design and how do we fit into it. It's not just, you know, let's write about this house. Let me tell you it's 3,000 square feet. Let me tell you what vernacular it is in. You know, that's not... I don't think that draws people in. So there's the difference is catching them and then how do you process them once you have them? Yep. And I think you need both. So what is the process, Ariana, that you go to to, to line up these press interviews? Uh, what does it take to make those happen? So you just mentioned, I think you said four press interviews in the past week. What does it take to, know, to do that? 
you know, I think part of marketing is knowing that it's not about you. It's always about the other person. And I will contact a journalist directly and we'll have a, a discussion on what it is that they've written. And you can pull apart, you know, what you think their interests are. A lot of journalists aren't writing about something per se. That's why they got into journalism. You know, they're writing a story that was given to them. And we craft a story together. And I think that's very intriguing for most of the people I've had a conversation with recently. But I'm very transparent. You know, I just approached them and I said, this is what I want to talk about. And I've thought this through and I've thought about you. Uh, it's sort of like grad school. I didn't apply for the school. I applied for that advisor specifically. So I wasn't going to Pacific Coast Business Times or Wall Street Journal or you know, and just saying here, I want to write about architecture. I went to one specific journalist or two sometimes and said, you know, based on your portfolio and what I think your interests are, I think this could be mutually beneficial. And that's, I think that's the approach. I don't know how else to sell something to someone else because everybody wants to buy, but no one wants to be sold. Right? So how do you, how do you make something? Cause if, if someone came to me and said, you know, I, I want to do this and you should help me because it benefits me. That's not a selling point. You know, you have to, why is it important to them to write about me? And I, I don't know if there's a magical, uh, you know, ingredient kit I can create for other people in marketing and they can run with it. I think one, you have to have a genuine interest in who you're speaking with. It's if you don't, it's not going to work. You're not going to have a good dialogue. You know, all, all these press people, I met them on the weekend. I met with someone on Christmas Eve and he thought it was so strange because our office was closed. And I said, well, okay, but let's go. And I said, let's have lunch. We had a two and a half, three hour lunch. And that wasn't even the primary interview. It was just, I want to get to know you and hear your story. No one asks a journalist what their story is. And, you know, I have great contacts and I go out with them every week for dinner or a beer and I want to hear what they've been up to. And now when I need something, they're pretty good about responding and saying, yes, this is going to be an interesting relationship. So, so Ariana, it looks like we're, so we're talking about relationship building here. We're kind of getting into the weeds, which is great about, you know, cold prospecting, forming what we just talked about was forming the initial relationship, right? Coming at it in terms of what's in it for you. Like if I'm talking to Ariana, I'm going to present everything and how I can help Ariana, what she's looking for, how I can help her meet her goals. Right. So that's what we just talked about. Now, how do you, after you've established those relationships, how do you nurture them? You know, that's another kind of hat I've been able to take off of clay and Josh, you asked me what I do. Nurturing relationships is very costly in time. It is, and a lot of contacts kind of fall through the cracks and you forget about them. I have, you know, bi-monthly contact with all 1900 people in my phone book, in my, on my phone. So I make an effort to reach out to every single person in some capacity and check in. And I'm not saying, you know, you need to do that with everybody, but you need, people need I don't know, uh, a way to categorize the importance of the people in your life and you need to follow up. It's, you know, I don't, as a broker, you know, I met clients right out of Stanford starting startups and they needed, you know, a 500 square foot garage for their biotech lab. Mm -hmm. You know, they were nothing. They were little kids with sweatshirts and skinny jeans. And then three, three years later, they needed a 6,000 square foot space and they actually needed to build out a proper lab. A couple years after that, they needed a 25,000 square foot lab. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, it's, you know, an Amgen worthy <laughs> biotech facility. And uh, that's, but that relationship is very long term, but you have to stay there with them the whole time. Otherwise, some point there's going to be a kink and they go with another broker. And so I think being a commission only real estate, commercial real estate broker, specifically, uh, I was in corporate services, which is concierge brokerage. You know, you're going on vacations with them. You're accessible 24 seven. There's no, you know, it's five o'clock, you know, I'll see you on Monday. And I think that was a valuable lesson for how to maintain relationships. And that's, you know, when people ask, you know, how do I do it? You just do it. 
You know, I know, I know that's not a, a beautiful articulate way to, to say it, but it's really just picking up the phone or sending them an email or, you know, I have clients now, part of how we met is, you know, they became clients, but if I see an interesting building, I text them a photo. It has nothing to do with the current project. A lot of times it becomes a current project just because they went, you know what? She thought of me. It was a Saturday morning and she thought of me. And you just, you have to go out there. And I think you have to identify what your personality is. You know, not everyone can do marketing. Not everyone can be an architect. Not everyone can do whatever it is that they're doing. I like to think of people in terms of dog breeds. It's not political. You know, no one's going to get mad at a, a poodle for not being a pit bull. A poodle's a poodle. It possesses all the qualities that it needs to be a poodle. I think people, we try to change. So I know my personality and I try to collect people and hear their stories. Not everyone is comfortable doing that. And so don't do it, you know, don't be in a sales or marketing function if that's not your personality. I don't know if that answers your question for how you follow up with people. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.